we are going to use all forms necessary to get our freedom in South Africa, whether it is violence against those who are violent against us, uh, whether it is any type of violence possible. The, our aim is to get our freedom, and we are prepared to get our freedom at whatever sacrifice necessary. The Soweto uprising of June 16, 1976, which spread across the country, forever altered South Africa's socio-political landscape. The events that sparked the uprising can be traced back to the apartheid government policies, which resulted in the passage of the Bantu Education Act in 1953. Many students' political awareness was enhanced by the rise of the Black Consciousness Movement BCM, and the founding of the South African Student Organization CESO, while others joined the tide of anti-apartheid feeling within the student population. When Afrikaans was established as a compulsory medium of instruction in schools alongside English in 1974, black students began to mobilize. On June 16, 1976, between 3,000 and 10,000 students were mobilized by the South African Students' Movement Action Committee, which was sponsored by the BCM, to peacefully oppose the government's mandate. The march was supposed to end with a rally in Orlando Stadium. They were met by heavily armed police who fired tear gas and eventually leave bullets on them as they made their way down the street. As a result, a massive insurrection erupted, leading to a revolt against the government. While the revolt started in Soweto, it quickly swept throughout the country and lasted until the next year. The apartheid administration suffered severe consequences as a result of the events of June 16, 1976. Images of police shooting at peacefully demonstrating students sparked international outrage, exposing South Africa's brutality. Meanwhile, the weakened and exiled liberation forces drew fresh recruits fleeing political repression at home, reviving the anti-apartheid campaign. In the term ban to education, the word Bantu is politically fraught and has pejorative overtones. The Bantu educational system was created in order to educate and fit Africans for their position in the newly formed apartheid society in 1948. Education was seen as part of a larger apartheid system that included homelands, urban limits, past laws, and job discrimination. This was solely a laborer, worker, and servant function. The creator of the Bantu Education Act, 1953, H.F. Favot, put it this way. There is no place for the African in the European community above the level of certain forms of labor. It is of no avail for him to receive a training which has as its aim, absorption in the European community. However, it is erroneous to believe that black South Africans were not educationally marginalized prior to apartheid. There existed a system of segregated and unequal schooling in the country long before the momentous 1948 white elections that handed the Nationalist Party power. While white education was free, mandatory, and expanding, black education was mostly ignored. Inadequate schooling facilities, teachers, and instructional resources, as well as student absenteeism or non-enrollment, resulted from financial underfunding and an urban inflow. A 1936 inquiry found issues, but nearly little was done to address them. The Iceland Commission was established by the government in 1949 to look into African education supply. For the successful reform of the Bantu school system, the commission suggested resorting to radical measures. Prior to the Bantu Education Act of the Apartheid Regime in 1953, 90% of black South African schools were state-aided mission institutions. The act required all such schools to register with the government, and it took authority of African education away from churches and provincial governments. The Bantu Education Department, an entity intended to keep in it distinct and inferior, was in charge of maintaining this control. Almost all of the mission schools were shut down. In its attempt to maintain its schools open without government funding, the Roman Catholic Church was entirely alone. The 1953 Act also removed African school funding from general government expenditure and tied it to a direct tax paid by Africans, resulting in significantly less money being spent on black children than on white children. 
black instructors and students protested Bantu education in 1954-5. To provide alternative education, the African Education Movement was founded. Cultural clubs served as informal classrooms for a few years before closing down in 1960. The extension of University Education Act 45 of 1959 made it illegal for black students to attend white universities, mainly the universities of Cape Town and Witwatersrand. This act established separate tribe colleges for black university students, separating academic institutions based on race. After the apartheid nationalist government recognized the necessity for a skilled African labor force in the late 1960s, spending on Bantu education surged. More African children attended school as a result of this than under the old missionary system, albeit with far less facilities when compared to other races, particularly whites. On a rotating basis, overcrowded classrooms were utilized. There were also a scarcity of teachers, and those that did teach were often underqualified. Only 10% of black instructors had completed their matriculation year, final year of high school, in 1961. Teachers were less qualified than their students, and black education was virtually regressing. The Colored Persons Education Act of 1963 gave the Department of Colored Affairs jurisdiction over colored education. Colored schools were required to register with the government as well. Although colored education became compulsory, it was successfully separated from white education. To segregate and control Indian education, the Indian Education Act of 1965 was passed and it was put under the Department of Indian Affairs. The SAIC took over some educational activities in 1976. Indian education was also made obligatory. Between 1962 and 1971, no new high schools were established in Soweto due to the government's homelands policy, as students were expected to relocate to their respective homelands to attend newly constructed schools there. After that, in 1972, the government caved into business pressure to strengthen the Bantu education system in order to meet the demand for a better trained black workforce. In Soweto, 40 new schools were built. The number of secondary school students increased from 12,656 to 34,656 between 1972 and 1976. One out of every five children in Soweto was in secondary school. The impact of increased secondary school attendance on teenage culture was enormous. Many young people used to spend the time between finishing elementary school and landing a job, if they were lucky, in gangs, which lacked political awareness. Secondary school students, on the other hand, were forming their own opinions and ideologies. The Black South African Student Organization, SESO, was established in 1969. Despite the fact that Bantu education was intended to deprive Africans of their rights and isolate them from subversive ideas, outrage at receiving such a gutter education became a major source of resistance. Some reform attempts were undertaken in the aftermath of this effective and unequivocal protest, but it was too little, too late. Into the 1990s, major discrepancies in racially distinct school provision persisted. On the 16th of June 1976, high school students in Soweto began protesting for better education, and police replied with tear gas and live bullets. It is celebrated today as Youth Day, a South African national holiday that remembers all the young people who died in the struggle against apartheid and Bantu education. The Bantu education system, which was the subject of virtually constant criticism in the 1980s, providing relatively little education. The consequences of decades of bad education, underdevelopment, low self-esteem, economic despair, unemployment, crime, and so on, have lingered long after the first democratic elections in 1994 and the formation of the Government of National Unity. Obviously, not all kids in previous generations worshipped the school administrators. In 1920, the first known lesson stoppages, sometimes referred to as strikes in South African newspapers, 
and the first riots in African schools took place. Students at the Kyunatan Training Institution went on a hunger strike in February to demand more food. Students at Cape Town schools reacted to the news of events in Soweto. We haven't done anything by way of teaching since the Soweto riots initially began, a teacher at one of the colored schools subsequently wrote. The kids were agitated, nervous, and perplexed. Although there is no record of what the African children believed, it is known that they were aware of the increased police patrols in the townships following June 16th. A teacher at one of the schools detailed what happened after the initial shootings in Cape Town. Throughout the 1960s, black students fought a tenacious battle for the right to join the National Union of South African Students, NUSAS, but the motion was denied by campus administrators. NUSAS was likewise excited to have the colleges join their ranks, not only would this make it the country's largest student organization, but it would also gather all student opponents of the government's apartheid policies. The main cause of the protest that began at African schools in the Transvaal at the beginning of 1975 was an order from the Bantu Education Department that Africans be used on an equal footing with English as one of the department's secondary school languages of teaching. The introduction of Africans alongside English as a language of teaching is thought to be the immediate cause of the 1976 student unrest, but there are a number of other variables at play. These causes may undoubtedly be traced back to the apartheid government Bantu Education Act of 1953. Under the direction of Dr. Hendrik F. Favort, the act established a new Department of Bantu Education, which was later absorbed into the Department of Native Affairs. The uprisings were directly caused by the provisions of the Bantu Education Act and some policy pronouncements made by the Bantu Education Department. Natives, blacks, must be taught from an early age that equality with Europeans, the whites, is not for them, said Dr. Favort, the architect of the Bantu Education Act. There was a severe scarcity of schools for black youngsters across the country. The government spent significantly more money on white education than it did on black education. Each white student received 644 rand per year, while a black student received only 42 rand. In 1976, 257,505 students were enrolled in Form 1 at high schools with a total capacity of only 38,000. Students who had passed their Standard 6 examinations were asked to repeat the standard to help ease the problem. The students and their parents were enraged by this. Although the scenario did not immediately lead to a revolt, it did help to build up tensions in the run-up to the 1976 student uprising. Standard 8, or Junior Certificate, JC, was phased out by the government in 1975. Standard 6 had been phased out by that time, and many children graduating from primary schools were being assigned to the newly formed junior secondary schools. The 50 to 50 language rule was to be implemented in these junior secondary schools. A decision issued by the Bantu Education Department sparked widespread anger and fueled hatred, resulting in the 1976 rebellion. Deputy Minister Andrew Stranecht issued directives to school boards, inspectors, and principals stating that Africans should be taught on an equal footing with English in all schools. These instructions elicited a strong negative response from a number of people in the neighborhood. The Tswana School Boards which included school boards from Meadowlands, Dobsonville, and other Soweto regions, were the first to react. The following is taken from the minutes of the Tswana School Board meeting on January 20, 1976. The circuit inspector told the board that the Secretary for Bantu Education has stated that all direct taxes paid by the black population of South Africa are being sent to the various homelands for educational purposes there. In metropolitan areas, the white population, which includes English and African speakers, pays for a black child's education. As a result, the Secretary for Bantu Education is responsible for ensuring that English and African speakers are satisfied. As a result, 
the only way to satisfy both groups is for all schools to use a 50 to 50 medium of instruction. In the future, if schools use a medium not prescribed by the department for a particular subject, examination question papers will only be set in that medium, with no option for the other language. Teachers also express their displeasure with the government's announcement. Some black teachers in South Africa's African Teachers Association complained that they couldn't communicate in Afrikaans. Initially, the students formed cultural groups and youth clubs in their communities. There were numerous branches of the students' Christian movements, SCMs, that school, which were primarily political in nature. Between 1974 and 1976, SASM infiltrated these fortifications. When the time came for protests to erupt, SASM organized an action committee on June 13, 1976, eventually renamed the Soweto Student Representative Council, SSRC. National organizations such as the Black People's Convention, BPC, South African Student Organizations, SESO, and the Black Consciousness Philosophy educated and impacted them. They were opposed to being taught in the oppressor's language. The revolt took place at a period when liberation movements were outlawed across the country and apartheid reigned supreme in South Africa. The protest in Soweto began peacefully, but it quickly escalated when police opened fire on unarmed teenagers. The disturbance had gained momentum by the third day and had expanded to townships throughout Soweto and the rest of the country. The class of 1976 valiantly came to the streets and disproved the myth that workers were the only force capable of opposing apartheid. Indeed, where their parents had failed, they succeeded. They not only took over city centers, but also shut down schools and liquor stores. It's difficult to acquire a good picture of exactly what transpired on June 16. The majority of the information comes from eyewitness testimonies of students who took part in the protests, journalists on the site, and police reports. Much, as with all history, depends on the point of view of the individual who tells the story, as well as others who have written about it. Some accounts are in direct conflict with one another. We are not attempting to produce an objective report, but rather to provide a forum for people to relate their own stories, which we believe will result in a more accurate depiction of events. On the morning of June 16, not all of the youngsters who were supposed to participate in the march were aware of it. For many, it was just another day at school. However, by this time, Pupils were disgruntled with the Bantu education system in general, as well as the introduction of Afrikaans as a medium of teaching. It was exam time for the senior students, and many were afraid that if they had to write in Afrikaans, they would fail the exams. Despite this, the Action Committee of the Soweto Students' Representative Council, the SSRC, planned a well-organized march that would be conducted in a peaceful manner. The original marches leaders were primarily from two high schools, Naledi High in Naledi and Morris Isaacson in Mofolo. However, according to Sfison Lovo, the main hub of organizational activity was Fefeni Junior Secondary, which is located near Vilekosi Street in Orlando. Fefeni was certainly close to the train station, where many students disembarked to join the march. The objective was for Naledi High students to march in their direction, picking up students from other schools along the route. The Morris Isaacson students were to march from their school in a similar fashion until they met at a central location and proceeded peacefully to the Orlando Stadium together. Other schools were also included in the initial plan, but it's unclear whether the kids at all of them were aware of the march. Naledi High School was the first place where the students came together. The atmosphere was upbeat and joyful. At assembly, the principal expressed his support for the students and wished them luck. Tipelo Motopanian, the first chairwoman of the action committee, addressed them and told them that discipline and a peaceful march would be the order of the day. Meanwhile, students gathered at Maurice Isaacson. They were also addressed by Tsietsi Mashonini, 
one of the action committee's leaders, before departing. They went by other schools along the route, where some students were waiting and those who weren't were immediately recruited to join. Eleven columns of students marched to Orlando Stadium to gather at the focal point of Uncle Tom's Municipal Hall. There had been some brief fights with police prior to this point, but it was here that police stopped them, barricading their way. Other schools had been stopped by the police and dispersed earlier, but they were able to rejoin later. The exact number of students is unknown estimates range from 1,000 to 10,000. The march was stopped, and some individuals assisted Titsi Mashonini in boarding a tractor so that everyone could see him as he spoke to the crowd. Brothers and sisters, I appeal to you keep calm and cool. We have just received a report that the police are coming. Don't taunt them, don't do anything to them. Be cool and calm. We are not fighting. For both the cops and the students, it was a difficult situation. According to police reports, the situation was explosive, so they retreated to await reinforcements. The students marched until they reached Hector Peterson Square, which is today near to Orlando High School. The march came to a screeching halt once more. Various accounts of what sparked the shooting have been circulated. Despite the tight situation, the pupils were composed and well-behaved. Suddenly, a white police officer held a tear gas canister at the crowd's face. People were disoriented and coughing as they emerged from the smoke. The throng backed up slightly but continued to face the officers, brandishing banners and singing. A white cop pulled out his pistol. A shot was heard by black journalist standing near the police, take a look at him. He intends to fire at the children, and a shot was fired. There was a brief moment of silence before chaos erupted. Screams erupted from the students. There were more rounds fired. At least four kids were injured, and others screamed in every direction. Following the initial massacre, the students scattered in various directions. Retaliation was sparked by outrage over the needless killings. Vehicles and buildings belonging to the West Rand Administrative Buildings WIB were set on fire and burned to the ground. A white WIB officer was grabbed from his car and beaten to death, and bottle stores were burned and looted. More students were slain in other engagements with the police particularly near the Regina Mondi Church in Orlando and the Esso Garage in Chiawilo. As police stopped students in one area, they relocated their protest action to another. By the end of the day, most of Soweto had felt the impact of the demonstration, including Deep Kloof, which had been relatively peaceful earlier in the day. For some students, this was the first time they had or saw something like this. Schools were closed early, at 12 p.m., and many children walked out to a burning township. As additional pupils were allowed to leave school, they joined the closest demonstrators. According to some accounts, the afternoon's events were anarchy or a free-for-all, particularly because bottle stores and beer halls were invaded and looted. The apartheid press made every effort to present it in that light. The afternoon's proceedings were clearly unorganized, and there was a sense of terror and resistance in the air. Others, on the other hand, claimed that the students targeted targets for political purposes and that they were selective in who and what they assaulted. A compassionate white university student was escorted to safety by the school children themselves. WIB structures and vehicles were raised in large numbers. One black-owned business, Richard Maponio's shop, was targeted, but it was done on purpose. Maponio was a wealthy businessman who was loathed by the majority of the population because he exploits us and sells out, they claimed. The pillaging of bottle stores was probably a bit of a free-for-all. Many students brought alcohol home with them, and many people relished the spoils. People have long suspected that the apartheid administration used alcohol to try to make black people lethargic. 
the municipality constructed the majority of the beer halls. Less liquor, greater education, many chanted. The raids on the bottle businesses were likely motivated by a variety of factors. There are people who are more politically driven and disciplined than others in any political protest. To perceive it as one or the other is to misunderstand the nature of political mass action. The fires raged on well into the night. Armored police cars, subsequently known as hippos, began marching into Soweto about 2100 hours hours. Officially, 23 individuals were murdered, although some sources suggested that the number was closer to 200. It's difficult to say how many people were killed as a result of police efforts to conceal the number of deaths. Now hold it right there. Have you subscribed? It's okay, you can subscribe now. Thank you. Now we can proceed. Thanks for subscribing to my channel. The second day was characterized by unrestrained rage and smoldering anger. Police took a different approach as well. They fired at will, as well as at anyone who raised a fist and shouted power in their face. A large number of people joined the original protest. Although not everyone had heard about Hector Peterson and the other victims, but word was getting out. The events are summarized in the heavily skewed Cilius report for this day. Schools, trains, buses, delivery vehicles, buildings of the West Rand Administrative Buildings, WIB, and business people's cars were all targeted. The rage and frustration that had been building among the young of the townships was let loose. On the morning of the 17th, 1,500 police officers equipped with stern guns, automatic rifles, and hand machine carbines took up strategic positions across the municipality. Helicopters swooped down from the sky. The army was ready to deploy. Other than the firing of live bullets, the police force has never developed any other tactics of crowd control. The police opened fire indiscriminately, resulting in even more casualties than the day before. The police's retaliation was simply making the students angrier. Mr. Money Moda reported at a news conference that practically all of the WIB buildings in Sowito had been demolished. This resulted in the burning of 21 offices, the plundering of 10, the burning of 3 schools, and the burning of an unknown number of municipal halls, beer halls, and bottle stores. Overnight, the run had depreciated in value. Hundreds of thousands of workers had refused to show up for work. The apartheid regime was in fact facing a crisis. In view of U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger's upcoming visit to South Africa, it was also a major embarrassment. In addition, 300 mostly white with students marched through the city center to condemn school children's deaths. Many black employees joined them as they marched through the streets. At this moment, the Soweto Students' Representative Council, SSRC, SSM, and other organizations were desperately attempting to seize control of the protest, channel the youth's rage, and give the movement political direction. Exiled members of the African National Congress, ANC, have urged for swift international action and the tightening of economic sanctions. The demonstrations extended to other townships in the Soweto area. Students in Tembiza organized the solidarity march that, while being tightly guarded, and did not result in violence. In Kojiso, police attempted to disperse a crowd of students and adults, but were forced to retreat and WIB facilities, vehicles, and schools were destroyed. When reinforcements arrived, police opened fire indiscriminately at the throng, killing at least five individuals. The situation in Soweto remained turbulent on the third day of the uprising, June 18th. In Morocco, there were a few fatalities outside the butchery. Many Soweto townships, including Zola, Equizi, Molatsen, Naledi, and Tlodi, were engulfed in flames. Administrative buildings, wine shops, and beer halls, all of which were despised by the youth, were also set ablaze. Buses and cars that were passing through Soweto were set on fire. 
In an attempt to restore normalcy in the community, police increased their terror. This, however, enraged the insurgent young people who were pitted against highly armed police. To counter armored police cars, helicopters, and firearms, they used stones. Manier Morda, the chairperson of the West Rand Administrative Board, WIB, arrived in Soweto at 10 a.m. to assess the situation. A huge police van was escorting him. After Morda's visit, all of the WIB-owned cars that had survived being burnt were removed from Soweto. The convoys of automobiles sped past the Orlando police station, heading for Johannesburg. However, the action had already spread to the east and west Rand townships, as well as other parts of the country, on this day. People in other parts of the country did not rise up in protest to show their support for the people of Soweto. They had the same issue, shared the same sorrows, and had the same reasons for resentment and disobedience. In Alexandra Township, a general strike was called, and four individuals were killed when police opened fire on marching civilians. The government, which addressed the issue publicly for the first time, and justified the police's strong measures. There have been tales of students grabbing police weapons and using them to retaliate. Not only in Soweto, but throughout South Africa, the act sparked widespread violence. The Soweto Rebellion in June 1976 gave a good opportunity for exiled political organizations, particularly the African National Congress, ANC, and Pan-Africanist Congress, PAC, to recruit and train young men and women for military service. Many black people believed they were in danger of being arrested by the police, and as a result, new underground activities arose in response to this fear. Many enraged students took up arms against the government and were sent for military training as a result of covert recruitment activities. As a result, military camps outside the country, such as Mkombein in Temik, Tanzania, under the direction and mentorship of Ntate Mashigo, and the engineering camp in Angola, have sprung up. Recruits were given instructions on how to illegally cross into Botswana, Swaziland, Angola, Mozambique, and Tanzania, where they would get military training. The rise to power in 1975 of the Mozambique Liberation Front, Frelimo, in Mozambique and the Popular Movement for the Liberation of Angola, MPLA, in Angola, combined with the exodus of thousands of young people in the months following the Soweto uprising, created favorable conditions for the resumption of sabotage activity in South Africa, particularly after the collapse of the ANC slash Sopo joint operation, i.e. the Wanki campaign. Following these events, trained fighters were infiltrated back into South Africa, bombings on white targets were carried out, and anti-apartheid activists were arrested and tried. The significant recruitment of people and subsequent transportation out of South Africa was clearly an issue that resulted in a large number of trials under security legislation. While there is evidence that this was already on the rise prior to June 1976, the revolt of 1976 gave a huge boost to the activity of organizations that recruit people for military training. This is particularly true of the ANC but there is some evidence that PAC activity has been revived to some extent. As a result, many South Africans found themselves in ANC and PAC training camps. During this time, there were a slew of court cases challenging military recruiting. The number of people charged with this crime appears to rise in 1977 and the first half of 1978. Many trained guerrilla fighters returned to South Africa frequently with huge quantities of weaponry, explosives, and ammunition in their possession. In the aftermath of the June 1976 insurrection, this group included black school students who escaped or were recruited. The case of Petrus Bushimolev, 22, who received training in East Germany and was charged with sabotage and terrorism under the Sabotage and Terrorism Act of June 1962 and June 1967, respectively, is an example of their operations. The vast quantity of weaponry and ammunition discovered by authorities in their attempts to track down insurgents in urban areas and conflicts in rural regions was linked to this. 
It's worth noting that the majority of the weaponry found in the arms caches came from the former Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc countries, implying that the West was not willing to back the Southern African Liberation Groups in the same way. A group of armed guerrillas clashed with South African police near Bordergate, on the Swaziland slash South African border, on November 30, 1976. One of the rebels blew a hand grenade, injuring two police officers and allowing the militants to flee. A railway line at Diggale, in the Pietersburg region, had been destroyed in a successful sabotage effort just before this occurrence. Security police captured a number of ANC activists in a series of raids that spanned Johannesburg, Soweto, Alexandra, Rosenberg, ODI, Nebo, Pietersburg, and Sekukunaland beginning in December 1976. In the famous Pretoria 12 trial, 12 suspected activists, including Mosema Gabriel Tokyo Sexwell, were indicted under the Terrorism Act in the middle of 1977. They were mostly suspected of being members or active supporters of illegal organizations in South Africa, Swaziland, Mozambique, Russia, and China, such as the African National Congress, ANC, the South African Communist Party, SACP, and Omkonto Wisiswe, Omkonto Wisiswe, MK. They were also charged with endangering law and order in South Africa in various ways, as well as receiving military and other training, possessing explosives, ammunition, firearms, and weapons, harboring and providing assistance to guerrillas, and participating in the activities of a banned organization. They were all convicted on the principal allegation of sedition after being suspected of plotting to overthrow the white government. As a result, the political organizations working in exile responded by mobilizing people, recruiting individuals, and organizing the military phase of the struggle from the outside in order to overthrow the apartheid regime. Clearly, the events of the Soweto uprising and the reaction of the exiled liberation movement are not isolated events. They have their origins in a spirit of opposition to apartheid's increasing crisis. South Africa's collective resistance to oppression and exploitation supports the link that developed between internal and external forms of organization following this incident. It resulted in significant changes in the strategies of the various exiled liberation movements, allowing them to better adapt to changing conditions in the nation. A militant attitude was emphasized, which manifested itself in the recruitment and subsequent training of cadres in neighboring countries as well as several European and Asian countries. Where you do have uh, the whites in control and then using their position really to deny African people certain rights, certain fundamental human rights, uh, that tends to build amongst the Africans. I hope that will not be the case. But a, 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 a frustration and to a certain extent hatred. I hope not. But there will be the tendency in that direction.